Good day and welcome to Crystal Church. Listen, we are embarking on a brand new series called How to Recognize Him. The series we will discover how to understand the voice of God, how to understand our purpose in Him, and how to know that this is truly God and His purpose and plan for our lives. Listen, you don't want to miss not one episode in the series. So let's get ready to check out How to Recognize Him. Check this out. Has it been good to you? Well, he's been good to me, and that is why I can't help it but give him all the glory that he alone deserves, for he is risen. Hallelujah. Now, this morning, I would like to speak to you. Tell your neighbor before you sit, say, she's speaking on resurrected hope. My topic for this morning, resurrected hope. You may have your seats. Um, our, my theme or the key verse that I want to use this morning um, from Luke 24, um, we read from 17 to 24, but the key verse is, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Now in um, we first heard um, when we started off with the series of a recognizing Jesus, um, Pastor Neil brought um, the distorted view, um, you know, recognize Jesus. And then um, Rev came and Rev spoke on the, the, are you in the crowd or are you an influencer? And then Pastor Lester came and Pastor Lester said, near the cross, Right? And then Xavier came and Xavier spoke on awake. Yeah? And you will see it's from the beginning, right? Recognizing him, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And then um, this morning, I want to just continue because we were at the resurrection. We were on Palm Sunday. We were at the resurrection and we were... I mean, at the crucifixion, and we were at the resurrection, and now we're after the resurrection, right? And so now, um, people place their hopes in many different things. Um, some of us place our hope in families, a family member who's a provider, or maybe the breadwinner in the family. And when something happens to that person, um, the person dies, or the person is so sick, um, that the person can't actually provide anymore, um, it seems like then all hope is lost, right? Some people put their hope in careers. Your job means everything to you. You give your time, your effort, your life. Some even neglect their families because their jobs or their careers are first priority, right? And when it fails... It seems like all hope is gone. Others put their hope in health. They spend thousands of rands um, at the gym and to buy uh, uh, all these foods, healthy foods and things like that. Um, but who knows, someone like Steve Jobs, he had all the money in the world. Um, he was fit, but hey, when health knocked with all that money. If it fails, it seems like all hope is gone. Others, and especially today in our, uh, 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 in this lifetime that we're living in, many place their hope in material things. Others worship material possessions. They buy the best for their homes. Uh, they wear the best clothing the best cars they're driving, the best furniture is in their house, but they neglect the house of God. Well, beloved, hope placed anywhere but in Christ is futile and is certain to disappoint us. What is it to experience hopelessness? Did you ever ask yourself? What is it that you experience 
a sense of hopelessness. Maybe you are here and you know that feeling. Well, I have the answer. Hopelessness is when we experience the going down of the sun of joy. When the dark skies covers the ability to see. Hopelessness is when the harmonious sound of life run into discord and you can't make sense out of life's nonsense. Hopelessness is that point in life when we thought we were free. Then we experience the gravity of enslavement. Hopelessness is when in all of our decisions we discover we no longer can keep what we've promised. Hopelessness is that point where someone bragged about selling drugs and others knew he was wrong, but he said, I can stop when I want to. Hopelessness. When we experience hopelessness, it's when habitual habits become compulsive forces and compulsion runs into repulsion. Hopelessness is when a man who drinks brags about how he can hold his whiskey glass and then his whiskey starts holding him. Hopelessness is when a young man walks away from his daddy and says, You lived your life, now leave me alone to live mine. Hopelessness is when a young woman tells her mama, Leave me alone, I didn't ask to be born. I'm on my way to live my own life. Just because... Boys are telling her that you making us look good or feel good. She thinks life is good. But then she wakes up one day and she discovers there are better bodies made every day. You know, the saddest thing in life is to see a woman who depends on a physical beauty and talents and age begins to take both of them from her. And the same people she used to look down on, she's got to lean on. What do you do when hope dies? What do you do when life, with life, when you've been giving most of your time to a job and you discover it's not the source of your joy? How do you handle your life when the sun of joy goes down beyond the hills of happiness? I came to tell you, my friend, a loss of hope will dismantle your dreams. A loss of hope will diminish your expectations. A loss of hope will disintegrate your dedication. Listen, you don't have to be black and living in a squatter camp to experience the death of hope. When hope dies, you need something else. You need Jesus Christ, the resurrected hope. I say when hope dies, you need something else. You need Jesus Christ, the resurrected hope. Hallelujah. So go with me back to our text. We're dealing with uh, a woman, right? Woman who went to the tomb. And then secondly, we're dealing with men on the road to Emmaus. And then we're dealing with the disciples. And I want you to watch them. When their hope dies. Right? Firstly, the woman. The woman came to the tomb. But look what they came with. <laughs> they didn't come dancing and singing and shouting. They didn't even come uh, um, to fulfill their dreams. No. The woman at the tomb, instead, they came with oil. They came with frankincense and myrrh. They came to embalm a dead hero, not to welcome a resurrected savior.
Savior. And even when he showed up, they didn't even recognize him. Because Mary said, they have taken my Lord and I don't know where they laid him. Mary standing at the tomb. She saw Jesus Christ is not there. He told them on the third day, I am rising up from the grave. They knew about it. But Mary was standing at the tomb crying. Even when the others left already. You know what happened to Mary? Mary got stuck in the middle of purpose. She's standing at what she has lost. She didn't see the miracle right in her midst. She stands at what used to be. How many times do we remain stagnant at one place and look at what used to be? She was weeping. She don't just walk away. No, she asked questions. She asked, where did you take him? She waited. She wasn't aware that he was right there in her midst. Instead, she thought it's a gardener. She saw Jesus as a gardener. She did not recognize the resurrected hope that is right in the midst. How many times do you cry over things that happened to you in the past? Are you still standing and weeping at the things you've lost? That divorce, it's long past. He moved on with his life. She moved on already, but you're still standing in the past and crying and asking questions. The sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the emotional abuse, the person who did you wrong, the deal that went south. How long are you going to stand in the past? For the lover who walked out on you. The people who left you. Listen. When you are stuck. In a position. You will never be able to live your destiny. For when you live in the past. You will never see the future. Because you can't look in the rearview mirror and go toward the future. That is when you're in a stuck position. It's time to smell the coffee, baby girl. Because he's no longer in the tomb. Yay, he's resurrected. He's alive in you and me. He made you a new creature. Listen, the old things has passed away. And behold, everything became new. So stop standing at what used to be. Stop crying. Stop asking questions. For you see, Mary didn't stay there. Instead, Mary went from the experience of power to a carrier of power. She saw that no, he is resurrected, so I must go because he said I must go tell Peter. Then she went to Peter. You and I too can become powerful witnesses of this resurrection. 
of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, let's look at the two men on the road to Emmaus. They were actually walking from the tomb. They were walking from the power of the resurrection. <laughs> they were going west. And west is sundown. So many people, when they're in situations, they like this two disciples on their way to Emmaus. They went to a village called Emmaus. And they were busy talking about Jesus. And while they were talking, Jesus appeared in their midst. And he, he asked, what, what are you conversing about? What are you talking about? You know, it's like, uh, 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 so, yeah, what, what, what's this? You know what? Uh, when I was studying this, I, I saw it, man. I saw your Cleopas and another one. I saw the chains are busy. They, they, they chatting, talking, man. Yo, lekker. And then uh, Jesus came and Jesus said, what are you talking about? And they said, uh, oh, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Everybody's talking about this, but you don't know what happened. You see, they actually took uh, uh, this man. He, he's, he's a prophet. He's a mighty man. Uh, and they, they actually crucified him. You know, now, 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 now I like this because many times we don't see who's really in the midst. It reminds me sometimes when we visit with people or we come in and we go to a conference and we're all together and we walk in and the people don't really know us. They don't know Reverend Carl Hendricks and he's also just quiet listening and blah, blah, blah. And then when someone else recognizes him and they know him and then they talk about it, then, I, then they say, wow, are you that pastor of Crystal? Because you play low profile. Now Jesus was like that. He, he, he just walked in, you know, and he spoke to them. And now, I like Gregory the Great says, he says this, he says, these two disciples did not have faith in Jesus, yet they were talking about him. The Lord therefore appeared to them, but did not show them a face they could recognize. Now, in this way, the Lord enacted outwardly. Before their physical eyes, what was going on in them inwardly, before the eyes of their hearts. For inwardly, they simultaneously loved him and doubted him. Does that sound familiar? Therefore, the Lord was outwardly present to them. And at the same time, did not reveal his identity. You cannot quote the scriptures without believing it and acting on it. That's why Jesus don't appear in your midst. Because you speak about him, but you don't really know who he is. If you knew he who is in your midst, you will praise him. You will lift him up and he will show his appearance. Now since they were speaking about him, he showed them only his presence. But since they doubted him, he hid from them the appearance by which they could have recognized him. Do you understand that? Since they were speaking about him, you and I speak about him. We speak about <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ who redeemed us, who set us free. Am I right? Yeah? He showed them his presence. So he comes and he, he lives in the presence. But since they doubted him, he hid 
them the appearance by which they could have recognized him. How do you recognize Christ? In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men shall see vision. Old men shall dream dreams on my servants and my handmaidens. I, handmaidens. I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. Listen, I will do miracles. Greater things shall you do in my name. And that is when he steps in. When we believe his word and we don't doubt him, we will see his appearance in our situations. Do you get it? Jesus let them tell about their anxieties and their pains. He let them grieve and mourn by expressing the root causes. Jesus emphatically listened to them who poured out their crisis and their doubts and used scriptures like if you look at verse 25 so that they could better understand suffering and glory. During their journey to Emmaus, Jesus patiently guided them from hopelessness to celebration and also intended to nourish their faith to such an extent that they can see his real presence in the breaking of bread. When you're sick in your body and you break the bread, sickness will have to flee if you don't doubt the word. I can see you walking with a friend and telling her or him how you're struggling to pay the bills and how the debtors are on your trail and how you're asking God for a breakthrough and you say, yay, when I pray it seems like it's hitting the ceiling. You say, you know, he can make a way but do you really believe he's in your midst? Do you really recognize him? Do you really have faith in the resurrected hope? Do you know that he's in your situation and you are never alone beloved it was at the breaking of bread that their eyes opened and they recognized him they saw the resurrected hope in the communion with him I pray this morning that God will open your eyes and that you will see the hope of glory I pray according to Ephesians 1 verse 18. May the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. These men were enthusiastic. And enthusiasm flooded their whole being when they encountered the resurrected hope. So much so that they went all the way back to Jerusalem to share the good news. When the Lord opened their eyes and they saw they had no other alternative but to go out there back to Jerusalem and speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the Lord did something for you, that is why I cannot keep quiet. That is why I cannot be in a dead church. That is why, because I believe in the resurrected hope. His name is Jesus. He did something for me. He did something for my family. He did something for my children. He did something for my grandchildren they are not on drugs they are not on dope no because I see the resurrected hope I pray that you will have an encounter with the resurrected hope of glory and say as Isaiah said so do not fear says the Lord for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. First Peter 5.10 says, For those of you that are hopeless, listen to the verse. It says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, 
stand steadfast. Do you believe it? Thirdly, the disciples were above the tomb, hopeless because they were trying to recapture yesterday, again, the past. Jesus Christ already appeared, guys. He has already been resurrected when he appeared to them. They had already seen him. You know, sometimes, you know, when I, when I, when I uh, prepared, it was as if the Holy Spirit said, many of us are like this. We know the word. We know his promises. We know that Jesus can make a way. But in our hopeless situation, we run to a witch doctor. We run to a family member. We run to this, that, and the other. But Jesus already appeared to you. He did something already. I can't doubt him. Because if I look at my granddaughter, I see the hope. The resurrected hope. I see that Jesus is alive. He has resurrected. Hallelujah. So the disciples already seen Jesus. They had seen the resurrection and still they did not believe. Until Jesus showed them his hands and his feet. Hmm? And then he told them, I told you everything must be fulfilled that was written about me. Then he opened the minds of their understanding. So that they can understand the scripture. The disciples had a 99 degree turn, if there is a turn like that. They were filled with great joy and started praising God. Because, yay, they now saw that, yo, this one that's in our midst, Jesus, he said he was going to be resurrected. And look at it, it happened. They had no other option but to praise the great I am. Yeah. Hallelujah! I came to tell someone hope is resurrected and are no longer in the tomb. I came to tell someone that Paul says that we can rejoice in our suffering because we are a people of hope. Now sometimes, 
Shut up, my son, that I'm a sendo lobo sendo. Jesus, I am a hope. Hallelujah! It's living inside of me. That's why wherever I go, I have resurrection within me, and every dead situation must come alive when I speak to it. It must arise when I speak to that deadness and that dead finances. It must come alive in the name of Jesus. Now, sometimes, sometimes, you know, sometimes it feels like all your resources dried up and you're facing a hopeless situation. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I felt like that for a few, few months. And when I look at, at the situation, I say, Lord, I pray about this thing. I fast about this thing. It seems like all odds are against us. But Jesus Christ, when I read this, I said, Lord, I must have resurrected hope within me, men. I cannot let the devil run amok if I have the resurrected hope. Now, yeah, sometimes we feel like that, that we are, we are struggling and now we feel like we cannot go on because our resources dried up. But this morning I came to tell somebody who feels like that. I came to tell you I have a witness. Oh, and it was the woman of Zarephath. Uh, her resources dried up. Yes, she picked up sticks and she was going to wait for death because her resources dried up. Oh, but the resurrected hope of glory stepped into a situation because he is called Jesus Christ, our provider. Yes, yes, yes. He provides in that situation. Yes, I know. It seems like all odds are against you. But this morning, you have the resurrected hope. His name is Jesus Christ. Sometimes your body is aching. And doctors cannot find what's wrong with you. Because cancer is eating on your flesh. Excess blood sugar is wreaking havoc on your blood vessels all over your body. And it's causing a lot of complications. But yay, uh, my sister, my brother, I came to say there's resurrected hope in this house this morning. Because the resurrected hope says in Isaiah 53, by my stripes, oh, I am healed. That is why sickness cannot stay and take a, a place in my body. Because I have the resurrected hope. And if you don't believe it, yea, I came with a witness uh, that this was the woman with the issue of blood. Oh, yes, her medical aid was depleted and she had no money left for doctors. In fact, in fact, she tried, she tried all the doctors. But when she heard about the resurrected hope that is passing by her way, oh, even though there were people that said, oh, what do you want here? Can't you see so many surrounding him? But yeah, 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 yeah. In a weakness, in a weakness, she took the plunge and she touched the hem of his garment. And guess what? Everything became whole. So much so that the resurrected hope said, Who touched me? Yeah, shut up, Masando. Yeah, Lord Jesus. This morning I touch you. I touch you, Lord. I need a fresh touch to recognize the resurrected hope. Woo yeah, 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 yeah. The doctor said you won't make it. In fact, they gave you a few days to live or months. But I came with a witness 
His name is Lazarus. Listen, he was in the grave. He was thinking already, his sister said. But yea, when resurrected hope, called Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus had no option. But yea, in the clothes that was on him, listen, Lazarus heard the voice of resurrected hope. The one who was resurrected, resurrected that, that deadness within you. Lazarus heard the voice of resurrection. Bella. 
this. You are not here to stay in the pit. Darkness won't last forever. Daybreak must come. Can I get a witness? I came to tell you this morning. Hebrews 6 verse 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the veil. Because hope causes us not to get discouraged. Not to give up. Because we have something to keep going forward. Being confident of this very thing. That we who has begun a good work within you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So don't give up. Have hope in God. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the price of the upward calling of God in Jesus Christ, the resurrected hope. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to compare with the glory which shall be revealed in us. But may the God of grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, may he perfect, may he establish, may he strengthen, and may he settle you that you have resurrected hope in your midst wherever you go. For real hope is not a dead hope. Real hope causes us to want to take action to share this hope with others. If we really believe the Bible and what it says, if we really believe that Jesus is Lord, if we really believe in heaven, and if we really believe there is a hell, we will share our hope with others. You are here this morning. You hear the voice of God. You are in a situation. Ooh. You said, I can rather throw in the towel. I'm about to give up. I can't take this pressure anymore. I don't know when the sun will come to God. I have fasted. I've prayed. I trusted God. Listen, I gave you testimonies this morning that is written in the book. And if you really believe the book, the Bible, then you will take courage and you will have hope that he has risen and is not dead, but is alive in your situation. So this morning I'm speaking to you who do not know this resurrected hope. You know he gave his life on the cross of Calvary. He died because you were on his mind. When he hung there and the thorns, the crown of thorns was on his head. 
Someone wrote and said he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free because he loved you so much. He did not call them because it was in his power. But yet, John 3.16 said, For God so loved this world that he gave his only son. He gave him because we were on his mind. He saw you cannot do it on your own. That is why he stretched himself wide. Because he loved you so much. Yes, I know you tried rehabs. I know, I know you tried many doctors. I know the banks are about to take your house. I know your finances are dried up. I know. But I came with hope this morning and I ask may that hope arise for he is here in our midst and he loves you so much so don't give up on him trust that you enjoyed today's sermon if you are in the nearby Johannesburg area please join us at 7 Walton Street Johannesburg God bless you and thank you